All right, so Proverbs chapter 5, let's dig right here in, in, into verse number 1. Bible reads, My son, attend unto my wisdom. And again, I've made, I've made references before. You'll notice uh, definitely through the first like eight or nine chapters, all these references to my son, my son, my son. It's a father instructing his son. And I preached a lot about that last week. But look at this next phrase, and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Now, when the Bible says to bow your ear, we need to be humble in order to learn. So you think about bowing, right? You say when you bow your ear, you're, you're, you're lowering yourself. You're, you're, you're bringing yourself down a little bit. Now, he's talking to his son. I don't think his son is like way taller than him, right? That he has to physically bow down. This is obviously meant so that when someone is instructing you, when someone is teaching you, that you can be humble enough and have a humble heart and have a humble ear to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to listen, especially when the instruction is coming from God's Word. Right? We all need to be humble, not thinking that, hey, I know everything. Right? When you have that type of an attitude, you're guaranteed to learn nothing. Right. The Bible says in Luke 8.18, Jesus said, Take heed therefore how ye hear. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. He says, and that's a real interesting phrase, how you hear. Not what you hear. He says, be, uh, take heed how you hear. We need to be coming in to church or coming in to reading your Bible with a readiness. Prepared, your heart prepared, your ears prepared, how you hear the God, God's word. How did the children of Israel hear God's word when they were in the wilderness? When God was trying to lead them to the promised land, how did they hear? They didn't hear it very well. Because they kept on doubting God's word. They kept on saying, oh God, you brought us in this wilderness. Yo, you delivered us from the Egyptians just to kill us here with thirst. Oh, God, what do you, you know, we have no food. Oh, God, there's giants in the land. We can't take them. We, you know, what are you doing? You brought us all the way out here just to destroy us. They weren't hearing God's word. They weren't humbling themselves and, and, and fully trusting and just having faith. If God said it, then it must be true. If God said it, then I'm just going to believe it. If God said it, I'm going to do it. We need to have this type of an attitude in order to learn. We need to learn with humility. Another, a, a great example of, of being able to learn about the most important thing and being humble about it is just with our own salvation. Jesus Christ says in well, Mark 10, 14, you don't have to turn there, stay in Proverbs. Mark 10, 14 says, But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. What's that saying? In order to even get saved, you need to be able to humble yourself. Become like a little child. The same way a little child has faith in their parents to provide for them, has faith that they're going to be fed, they're going to be nourished, they're going to have all their needs met, they don't have to worry about any of the things of their life. You need to have that same type of childlike faith to put in Jesus Christ. And that requires humility. A child has to be humble because they can't do things on their own, right? It's not until we grow up and start being able to do things on our own that our pride gets lifted up and say, no, I'm going to do everything myself. Now, look, there's no, I, I appreciate a hardworking man, someone who likes to just be able to do things and I'm going to work and I'm going to do this and not burden anybody else and I'm going to do the work. And that's great for many things. But when it comes to God, when it comes to God's word, when it comes to being able to learn from God, there's some things you don't want to do on your own. There's things you don't want to have to figure out on your own. That's for sure. And especially with the subject matter that we're talking about in basically this entire chapter, chapter 5, you don't want to have to go and figure this out on your own. We need to humble ourselves and listen to God's Word. We need to bow our ear for a minute and say, Okay, God, I'm all ears. I'm not going to pretend like I know everything. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And see, it's easy, especially, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again, how repetitive many of the subject matter is in the book of Proverbs. There's not too much, you know, content overall being dealt with. I mean, there is, there is different variations, and we'll see as we get in further, there's some more things being covered. But if you notice, the first four chapters already have dealt with a lot of the same content. 
And we need to make sure that we're not just getting, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. And, and having that type of an attitude where we need to know, let's look at it, let's get our ears right, let's get our hearts right to get this wisdom. We're studying the book of Proverbs. It's a book designed to give you wisdom. If you have an attitude when you come in here thinking that you know it all, you won't learn anything. Now this chapter, we read the entire chapter before we got started, is about the strange woman. That's what it's basically, this entire chapter is dedicated to. Look at verse number 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And this, this topic comes up many times in the book of Proverbs. When we talk about the strange, we've already seen it. And it's going to come up again and again and again. And guys, take heed and take notice of this. And let any man that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. Okay, there is no temptation but such as is common to man. Okay, everything that we're going to be reading tonight and going through this, this is common to man. Now, women, pay attention too, but uh, honestly, the sermon tonight is going to be much more geared towards men. Now, you could try to apply this towards the opposite gender, okay, and still use it as a tool to, to look out what to look out for. But a lot of these, these attributes you're going to find very specifically as in a strange woman that is, that is out to, to, to hunt for the precious life. So we see here the very first warning says the lips of a strange woman. No, it says a strange woman it doesn't mean just like a weird woman, right? Strange just means they're a stranger to you. They're foreign. It's someone who's not your wife. That's a strange woman. It could be someone you've known for a while. If it's not your wife, that's considered a strange woman. And what we need to look out for, it says the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb. Honey's sweet. So the things that the strange woman says, they're going to sound really nice. Watch out for the flattery. I preach an entire sermon on flattery. Twice already. Once in this church and once a faithful word. Watch out for the flattery of the strange woman. The woman that just wants to continually praise you. Hey, and women, if, you know, if you're married, there's no reason for you to be praising another man to the point of flattery. You want to give someone a compliment, that's great, that's fine, that's not flattery. Men, watch out though, because men's egos like to be told how great they are. Men like to be um, appreciated, the work that they do. And just be told, wow, you're so, you know, you're so strong, oh wow, you're so smart, oh you're doing this. Men will eat that up. And men, watch out for that. Coming from a woman that's not your wife, watch out for that. Red flag should be going up right away. Her li the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Really nice, really smooth things come out of the mouth of the strange woman. But her end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. It's destruction in the end. Don't let the, the, the first part deceive you. Don't let the, the sweetest honey deceive you and trick you and pull you into that trap. It's just like that great, awesome smelling cheese or peanut butter or whatever you put on those mouse traps, right? It's really appealing. Looks great to the mouse. Oh man, I'm going to have a feast tonight. Look at all that food just sitting right out for me. Just calling unto me. Goes out there, boom. This is the same, the same type of warning about the strange woman. Amen. We need to take it that seriously. I mean, this is talking about destruction. We see later her, uh, her path leads to hell. But let's keep reading here. This is, I want, oh, turn if you would, keep a finger here. Turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 30 because I, I want you to, to notice some similarities here. When we're looking at the strange woman, I've noticed a lot of similarities between a strange woman and a false prophet. A lot of very similar attributes because they're both very deceptive and have an outward appearance and, and will say things to try to gain your confidence, will say things to try to get you into sin. Isaiah chapter 30. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says that this is a rebellious people Lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. 
prophesied deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. So notice, the strange woman, it says her mouth is smoother than oil. And these people that are seeking out a false prophet are saying, you know, don't preach unto us right things. Tell us some smooth things. We want, it. We want your, our ears to be tickled. We want you just to tell us what we want to hear. And that's a, that's a sign of a, a false prophet that's going to prophesy deceits, only say good things, only say smooth things, like the Joel Osteens, right, that can never say anything negative, never can warn you about the traps, never warn you about the sin. They're just going to tell you how great everything is. They say, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. We'll see a few more attributes of the false prophets. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, subject, on this topic, but it is, it is kind of important to see the, the similarities here. Matthew chapter 7, because, of course, Jesus warned of, of false prophets. Matthew 7, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And this is just like the adulteress, just like the strange woman that's going to try to flatter you with their mouth and speak the smooth things unto you. It's like being in sheep's clothing, right? Oh, she's so innocent. She's so harmless. That's what the false prophet is in the sheep's clothing. You say, because, you know, the analogy is we're sheep, right? And Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. And we're all like sheep. Well, the false prophet comes in and says, hey, I'm one of you. I'm a sheep too. But inside, they're a ravening wolf because, you know, the wolves love to eat the sheep. They love to devour and destroy the sheep. The strange woman comes in, speaking all kinds of things, all kinds of nice things, whatever it is that you want to hear. And inside... She's wicked and out to destroy him. Oh, I know you're married. Turn if you go to Matthew 23. We'll see one more, uh, one more illustration here that I think fits in just fine with the, with the strange woman. And again, it's in regard to the, to the false prophet. So I, just keep in mind, these are, these are primary applications to false prophets, but I think it's the same exact... You know, M.O. Of the, of the strange woman that we see in Proverbs chapter 5. Matthew 23, verse 27 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The false prophets, yeah, they look great and shiny and, and so righteous and holy on the outside. But he says inside they're full of dead men's bones. If you could see their, their heart, it's corrupt. It's like looking into a tomb, into a grave. There's no life there. That's the false prophet. And watch out, flip back if you would to Proverbs chapter 5. Watch out for the strange woman. Don't let your eyes be set on her Vain beauty, men. Don't be deceived by the outward appearance of this woman thinking, wow, there's this pretty woman that's giving me all these compliments. Because the strange woman described in Proverbs chapter 5, if you could see to her heart and see to her soul, it's corruption, it's wicked, and her path leads to hell. And it's not anything you want to have a part of. You could see you know, the, the, the television will, will put these images of women in front of you, of these, these, you know, these actresses that are supposed to be these bombshells, these beautiful women. But you know what you'd see if, you could actually just, if they would actually just show you a picture of what's in their heart? It wouldn't look anything like the outside at all. And that is not, ultimately, man, that is not what you want. You don't want the outside anyways. That's what your flesh wants. But that is for a moment. That is the pleasure of sin for a season. But inside is wickedness and destruction. You, you want, don't let this, let this sink in. Okay, because it's easy to get wrapped up in the, in the, in the smooth speaking. And for your ego to start taking over and thinking how great you are and wow, this beautiful woman thinks I'm so great and you start feeling really good about yourself and before you know it, 
There's a fall coming. Look at verse number 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. And the way of the strange woman... Her ways aren't set in stone. See, we ought to be having, we ought to have our faith and our direction and our belief and, and just the way that we go is set in stone. It's, it's founded on the rock. And the way that we live, it's going to be well known. If you want to know the, the, all of the you know, guidelines and, and principles on which you make decisions and the choices that you make in your life, they should be all right here. There should be solid ways. They're just, boom, it's here. We got it. And if anyone wants to know the ways that you're going to go, they should be able to find it right here. Not movable, not changeable. It's right here. But the ways of a woman, of the, of the strange woman, says her ways are movable that you can't know them. You don't know where she's going to go next. She's shifty. She'll tell you things that you just want to hear. doesn't have to be the truth. doesn't have to mean anything. Just for her own wicked end. She'll, she'll change whatever it is that she believes. And you can never actually figure out where she stands because she's not standing on the rock. And watch out for the women that will just say anything to you. Guys get deceived by this all the time. The adulteress that hunts for the precious life. They'll tell you, oh, maybe you're not married and she is. Oh, I'm going to divorce my husband. You know, telling you all these other things that she's going to do just to get what she wants out of you. Don't get fooled by that. We'll keep reading here. We're going to find out what happens when you do get involved with the whore, with the strange woman, with the adulteress. Look at verse number 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Don't even go close to where she lives. Stay far away from these type of women, from the strange woman. Don't even go close. Don't make provision for the flesh. Don't even start to wander by. Oh, I wonder what she's doing today. Don't. Don't go there. Verse number 9. Lest thou give thine honor unto others in thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. He's saying all of your work and all your efforts, everything is going to go to, some, to other people. You're not going to enjoy any of that when you get involved with the strange woman, with the whorish woman. You're going to end up doing, paying for other people's things and not for your own. So it says, strangers be filled with thy wealth. Now that can be either from you giving your, all your money to the strange woman because she's asking you for all this, or it could just be because God can do that to you. And cause you to lose your wealth and just and, and other people are going to spoil you. Verse number 11. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Now it's talking about your flesh and your body. Why? Because you'll get diseases. You find, you find a woman like this that's an adulterous woman, that's an evil woman in her heart, just looking to, to get you into bed or get, you know, defile the, the precious life. You're going to mourn at the last when your flesh and your body are consumed, when you're getting eaten up with the disease from the filthy whore. Verse 12, And say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear, to them that instructed me. Don't get to the point to where you have to experience this for yourself and then end up kicking yourself later for not having listened to the wisdom to begin with. Please do not learn this the hard way. This is something, you have a place you don't want to go. There's a lot of things that we end up learning. There's a lot of things I've learned the hard way in my life. Okay, this ought not to be one of them. This is a, a teaching that we need to be able to, to humble ourselves, bow down our ear, know that we don't know anything. Even if you heard this before, keep it fresh in your mind and keep it fresh in your heart to keep going day to day. You don't want, you don't want this teaching to fade. Because it starts to fade, all of a sudden that's when you're going to start hearing from the strange woman. And it's going to sound good at first. And if you don't have the wisdom of saying, whoa, wait a minute, I, I've read about this before in the Bible. I've read about this from God's Word. 
I better, I better check this thing out. I better see what this woman's really all about instead of just falling instantly for, for the, the praises of the strange woman. And don't give any occasion to get caught up with her at all. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. And I think this verse is real interesting too. It says, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. So he's talking about the strange woman. And he's saying, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation, in the middle of church. In church, I was almost in the midst of, the, of, of all evil. The strange woman is not just the prostitute that's out on the street corner. Watch out for the strange woman anywhere. Because like I said, the strange woman is someone who's not your wife. Someone who's a stranger to you. And guess what? It happens in churches too. Where you can have a wicked woman come into the congregation and, and try to spy out that, that precious life. I mean, the Bible says that the... The adulterous woman, she hunts for the precious life. It's a game. Like, and this is one of those things where it may be hard to comprehend for most people. But we read this through the book of Proverbs already earlier about the wicked man, the wicked person who doesn't sleep unless they cause some kind of mischief. The wicked man that's actually out and bent on destroying people's lives. And they actually try to go and do evil to people. That yes, there are people that are bad people in this world that are wicked in their heart, that are just looking to destroy and do bad unto people. There's also, it's not just men, it's women. And there are women that are out to find the most pure, righteous man so they could defile him. And it's a game to them. Oh, here's this great man who says he would never be, uh, uh, you know, cheat on his spouse. Here's someone who says he would never do that. I'm going to get him, you watch. And it's just a game to him. Watch out for that. They exist. He says, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation. Don't think it can't even happen at church. I mean, anywhere you go, watch out for it. Watch out for the high praises. Watch out for the, for the lips that are smoother than oil. Verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. All of that, verses 15 through 18, about the waters of your own cistern and the fountains is symbolic of your wife. That's why that last phrase is added, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. He's saying, look, Drink water. You have your own well. You've got your own source of water. When you're thirsty, go to that source. Don't be going to your neighbor's source. Don't be going to someone else's well and taking a drink out of their water. Don't be looking at someone else's water like, man, that water is probably really good. I've got this, I've got this old water over here. I've had this water for a long time. I'm kind of used to it. I've had this water. But, man, I've heard, you know, that, that guy's got a brand new cistern over there. That's, that's, that's got to be some tasty water over there. Don't be looking at that. To drink water out of your own cistern. That's why you rejoice with the wife of your youth. And hey, rejoice with the wife of your youth. Don't be bitter against your wife. You need to, and if this is a problem for you, this is, this is really important wisdom to get because this will help keep you from the strange woman. It's a lot easier to resist the, the, the ploy of the strange woman and those, those flattering words and everything else that she speaks unto you. It's a lot easier to resist that when you've got a great relationship already with your wife. The problem comes in is when you're getting kind of sick of your wife. When you're not rejoicing for your wife and just thinking, you know, you're getting, you're not content anymore. You're not content with the, with the wife of you, with the wife that God has given you. And you're out looking for something more. Maybe you're not even looking, but you're not appreciating your wife and rejoicing. We, we, we need to make it. Amen. And if you have a problem with this, if you think, you know what, I don't know if my heart is really as fond of my wife as it used to be, make a point to do something about it. Take some time apart. And you know, if, you're, if your heart is like that, you better treat this serious and say, you know what, I'm going to take off of work. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that I spend some time, valuable time with my wife and get back into rejoicing with her and rekindling what we had. That's the wise thing to do. That's going to keep you from this trap. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7. You can turn there if you'd like. Keep your finger here in Proverbs 5. Because in Proverbs 5, we're, you know, we're being admonished, you know, drink waters out of your own cistern. Out of your own well. Get, get your own water. It's, your own, it's, it's yours and yours only. And it's not strangers with you. Don't invite anyone else along. And this is why we get wives. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves a fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. One of the reasons you get married is because you want to enjoy a physical relationship with, with someone of the opposite gender. That's one of the reasons why you maybe said, look, it's good not to touch a woman, but to avoid fornication, because fornication is what happens when you're not married and you have that relationship with somebody. He's saying, that's a wicked sin. We don't want that to happen. So to avoid fornication, hey, get married. Get married. Have a spouse. And then you can enjoy your spouse and have that great relationship. And he's saying, look, don't, don't withhold either. Wives don't withhold from your husband. Husbands don't withhold from your wife. Why? That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Because Satan will be out to tempt you. And especially you're living for God. You're a Christian. You think you're on fire for God. You think you're going to serve God. And he notices, hey, this guy's got a weak link. There's a chink in his armor here. Because I see the relationship he's got with his wife and it's, you know, it's, it's lacking. He's not doing things for his, you know, whatever. The, the love seems to have gotten cold. And boom, Satan comes in and tempts you with a strange woman. So prevent this from happening. Preventative maintenance. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. That's what your wife is for. You ought to avoid fornication to, to begin with. So, hey, get that back. And if you have it, great. Don't let it go. Don't let it slip. Back in Proverbs 5. <clears throat> Verse number 19. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. This is the best advice for you men to avoid the strange woman. Be satisfied with your wife. Stay satisfied with your own wife. Love her. And if you don't feel like you're ravished with your wife's love, as I was just saying, then you're not spending enough time with her. And this is, this is one thing I do not recommend people to do ever. Because a lot of times people will think, well, we're always fighting when we're together, so we're going to spend some time apart. I think that is one of the worst things that you can do. I think it's the most dangerous thing for you to do. When you're already having problems with your spouse, don't separate. Because what that's going to do, it's going to start getting you used to not being around your spouse. And guess what? That accountability is going to be gone. And you start spending this time separate, you're going to start getting used to it, start thinking, hey, I could live like this. Hey, at least we're not fighting. This is actually pretty good. Instead of spending more time together and working through your problems. Because it's not, you shouldn't be fighting all the time. You need to be able to fix that. But, you know, when you made the vow and the promise for better or for worse, well, the worst part, that's what you make the vow for. It's not for the better part. Stick with the worst part and work on it. And spend the time necessary. And look, if you, if you have to, take off of work, take some time apart, and get the thing fixed. You don't want your whole family destroyed over the strange woman over something that you can prevent. Your marriage is worth it, and you don't want to fall for that trap. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5.
Ephesians chapter 5. Of course, very famous passage on, on husbands and wives and their, their duties and their roles and, and how they ought to be behaving within a marriage. Usually when we're turning here, the women get her beaten up quite a bit, but we're going to be focusing on the men tonight since we're looking at the strange woman. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 25. The Bible reads, Husbands, love your wives. This is a commandment. Look, if you're married, love your wife. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that's how much you need to love your wife enough to be able to give your life for her. If you love your wife enough to give your life for her, when you're having these hard times and these fights and these battles and these disputations, I, I would think you love her enough to try to work through that. I mean, if you love her enough to give your life for her, you should love her enough to try to figure out your problems and work through it. That is the amount of love that's expected from God when you have a wife. Be willing to give yourself for her. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. He's saying just as much as you like your own bodies, you know, you don't want any harm or anything bad coming to them, and you, you're going to do things to take care of yourself, do the same for your wife. Treat her as if she's just part of your body. And this is going to be the way that you will be able to avoid the trap of the strange woman. This is the best way when you're married to avoid that trap. Now, if you're single, look for the godly woman. Look for, the, which we're going to get to when we get to Proverbs 31. Look for the virtuous woman. Look for those attributes. And you'll be able to find what you ought to be looking for in a wife. And you'll find, hopefully very soon, once you get to know somebody, that if it's a, the strange woman that's defined here, her ways are going to be movable and shifty. You know, and you need to be able to pick up on that and not just listen and fall for the flattery. Let's keep reading here in Proverbs chapter 5. Look at verse number 20. Proverbs 5, verse 20. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. For his iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go, a, go astray. You may think that you can get away with cheating on your wife. You may think you got it all planned out. My wife will never know. Here's this strange woman. She's been coming on to me at work, and she's been saying all these great things, and I'm not satisfied with my wife, and I'm going to go and do this, and she'll never find out about it. And she'll never know because... I'm off at work and I could just take this time off and she'll never know about it. You know what? Even if that's the case, even if you are so bold and so stupid to think that you get away with it, you're not getting away with it in God's eyes. That's right. Amen. And God hates adultery. Amen. He sent Nathan the prophet when he was so upset and disgusted with David's behavior. And he gave him that whole long story. He said, Thou art the man. And David paid dearly for his indiscretion, for his stupidity in laying with, with another man's wife. He paid for that dearly. There's a lot of, of, of consequences he reaped in this life. He thought I'd get away with it. Remember, he thought, he, he thought he could cover it up. He's the king. He could cover it up, right? He covered up to the point where he took her husband's life. He starts building up all these lies and lie upon just because he didn't want to be discovered. And first, you know, he tries, he tries to get his, when he finds out that she's with child and tries to get uh, Uriah the Hittite to come back and he calls for him. He says, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll just make it so that he thinks it's his child. But then he won't go home because he's actually a noble man and, and he actually has, you know, integrity and um, was a righteous man. That didn't work. So David gets a point where he's like, well, I have no way to, to, to hide this. So he sends... By his own faithful servant's hand, his own death sentence to Joab. 
Uriah the Hittite was sent with his own death sentence in his hand as a faithful messenger. And the wickedness of David's heart all stemmed from that first sin of adultery. God knows. He sees everything. Be sure your sin will find you out. Let's look at verse 20 real quick before we close. Look at verse 20 again. The Bible says, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? Look at this. And embrace the bosom of a stranger. Here's wisdom for anyone who's ready to receive it. Don't embrace the bosom of a stranger. Amen. Now, there's it's pretty plain English. What's the bosom part of your body? Right? It's the front part, your chest, your bosom. Embracing the bosom of a stranger. Men that are married, I don't think you ought to be wrapping your arms around another woman and pulling her in and hugging her. I'm not talking about your grandma. <laughs> I'm not talking about your mom. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. I don't care if it's part of the culture. I don't care if someone's a huggy type of person. You know, you know what the most I do if I'm gonna if I'm gonna hug anyone that's you know, I mean a man, you know what, I'll give a hug and I'll give a pat on the back. There's nothing wrong with that. But if it's a woman and they're really kind of huggy, you know, you know what the most I'll do is one of these. Hey, buddy, you know, just put your arm around. Because I'm not, I'm not embracing the bosom, you know, it's just a, it's a friendly little hug. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. But, I mean, the Bible says here, you know, embrace, why would you, why would you um, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? That's wisdom. I mean, that's, that's what the Bible's saying. Look, I, stay away. There's no, there's no reason for it. There's nothing wrong with, with holding out your hand. I, was, I remember one time at, uh, I, was, I was taking a trip with Pastor Anderson back when I was going to Faithful Word. And we were, I forget where we were traveling to, but we were, we were on an airplane. I think it was from Washington, D.C. or something. And, you know, we were, we were separated. We had our own seats. And, he was talking to this girl on the flight. He tried to give her the gospel, but she was had a few drinks on the flight. She she a little tipsy by the time we got off. And I guess they had they had a good conversation or whatever. Like he talked about the gospel and and chit chatted with her. And then when we got off, we we um, we helped her carry some of her luggage a little bit. You know, was trying to be nice guys. Helped carry luggage to a, to a certain point, and then we parted ways. And you know, she went to go give him a hug, and he took a step back and stuck out his hand. So that's the right thing to do. You know, you could say, oh, but it's going to be awkward. So what? He valued his wife and not embracing the bosom of a stranger way more than maybe a potentially awkward moment. But you know what? It might have been a little bit awkward, but so what? I mean, she just kind of smiled and stuck out her hand and he shaked her hand. No big deal, right? It's just like people get so afraid of giving the gospel because, oh, isn't that awkward? You're going to bring up Jesus? Well, yeah, maybe for a person it might be a little awkward at first, but as soon as you get started talking, it's not awkward anymore. As soon as you shake that hand, as soon as you move, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. You move on. And you know what? You're, you're actually living the way that, that the Bible is trying to say here. You know, don't embrace the bosom of a stranger. So we need to watch out, especially as men. And women, you know, you can reverse this again, you know, thinking about a man and watch out for some of these things, but it's way more common for, for, the, for the women to be in this category and what we're reading here than for the men. But women, watch out for the deceitful man and for the man that just wants to get you into his bed and just do one thing with you and, then, and use you like a whore and be done with you. There's plenty of men out there like that. Watch out for them. Don't let them flatter you either. Don't let them just, just whatever these things are, just, just get carried away in what he's saying. Oh, wow, this guy is so dreamy. Oh, he's, he's saying all these great things and he's, he's so wonderful. He's putting so much attention on me. And they're just doing that to do, get one thing out of you. Don't fall for that. Look for the Christian man. Look for the Christian woman. Men, look for the Christian man, man ladies. And, and that's what you ought to be striving for. Someone who cares about you as a person and isn't just unloading all kinds of flattery on you. That's a red flag. But um, 
but actually cares and cares about God and cares about the Bible and cares about doing things right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction you give us. Lord, there's so many of these instructions that are actually very rudimentary, very simple, very basic, dear Lord, but so many people have a tendency to screw things up really bad. God, I pray that you would please give everyone in this room tonight the wisdom to, to know better and to be able to spot these traps that get laid out before us and not fall into them and not disregard your word, dear Lord, but that we would humbly accept your word and be able to keep it in memory so that later on, if these situations ever arise, we could remember, think back and say, you know what? I've read this before. I've been taught this before. I'm not going to go down that path. I'm not going to go down to the path that leads to hell from the strange woman, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just continue to increase our knowledge as we go through the book of Proverbs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.